Hello and welcome. I'm Heather Cronus Danik, Senior Director of Development for Individual Giving for the Ioneer Foundation. The Ioneer Foundation is the official fundraising entity for the departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. All that we do is, for re is to fund research to help people see, hear, and live better. Today's topic is glaucoma and the role of a patient navigator in vision care. We have two wonderful speakers today who I'm about to introduce, but first a couple housekeeping tips. Uh, you are muted, you, so unfortunately you're not able to join us in the conversation, but there is a Q&A button. Send us some questions, we want to answer them. Uh, now, if you do send a personal medical question, we won't discuss it uh, during the Q&A, but we will get back to you separately after today's event. So today's speakers, we have Dr. Andrew Williams. He is a board certified fellowship trained ophthalmologist spe specializing in the medical and surgical treatment of glaucoma and cataracts. He does both traditional surgery and cutting, a, cutting edge minimally invasive surgery. He has a strong research interest in improving healthcare delivery and ophthalmology by focusing on social determinants of health and system-based changes to broaden the delivery of eye care. We also have Dana McGinnis Thomas with us. She is a program manager and patient navigator for the Department of Ophthalmology. In this role, she works to build trusting relationships with patients who might otherwise fall through the cracks. Dana's position does many things and she wears many hats. She does everything from helping patients figure out how to get to appointments, to helping them fill out utility bills, uh, applications, and the like, she is a dynamo and we are lucky to have her and you're gonna hear much more about her during this hour. So I'm going to get off the screen and I'm gonna turn it over to our two speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, Heather. And thanks of course to Ironier Foundation for having us to talk about the work we're doing to improve patient care, improve access to care, and to really help patients with chronic eye diseases, particularly glaucoma, maintain the care they need. I think this is just a, such a critically important topic and something that I'm really grateful that the Ioneer Foundation has paid a lot of attention to uh, in supporting the work we're doing and, and, and the roles we have here. Because uh, I think this is really important and I'm hoping over the course of this hour um, to explain to you all why this is such an important topic. The topic today, as Heather mentioned, we're talking about glaucoma, so my area of clinical expertise and the role of patient navigator in vision care. And patient navigator is a very unique role we have at this department, um, something that, that Dana leads for us and just really is a wonderful way to help patients with a chronic condition like glaucoma maintain the care they need. And we'll go through that over these next few slides. Really important topic and I'm really glad we have a chance to talk about it with you all and have you all in the room with us. I wanted to start before getting too much into each step of this, this talk about a general roadmap of how we, we want to talk about these topics. First, glaucoma. Glaucoma is the first word of the talk. I want to talk about what that is and, and why this particular eye condition ties so nicely into this concept of a patient navigator and some of the, the importance of follow-up in glaucoma and how things like health-related social needs affect glaucoma care. We'll go into what that means, but things like transportation, being able to afford appointments, having health insurance, these are important factors to maintain long-term care for a chronic condition that requires lifelong treatment. Now, you can see there could be a gap there. Patients will have needs and have difficulty accessing care. And we think we can address a lot of those needs through several programs. One of them, the big pilot, I think, in this department is this patient navigator program, having somebody really to help connect patients in need with available resources to help maintain that long-term care that's necessary in the home. That's the overview. That's kind of the roadmap of how we want to kind of go through this conversation throughout today and really convince you all this is an important topic and a really important innovative thing that the department's doing with I and your foundation support. But we'll go through that in a little more depth first. I've said the word glaucoma a few times, I mentioned that I, I treat a lot of patients with glaucoma. Uh, I wanna talk for the first little bit about what glaucoma is. It's sort of this abstract concept you hear, it's sort of an eye condition that people have sometimes. Um, but glaucoma is a very important eye condition and one that ties really importantly in the follow-up as we suggested. 
Um, what is glaucoma? If you open a textbook, read the definition. This is a problem of the optic nerve, the cable that connects the eye to the brain. And the problem with that optic nerve is it loses tissue over time, and that generally leads to loss of peripheral vision. And that loss of peripheral vision can come in closer and closer and eventually take away all vision. And so it's a really important and blinding condition that we really need to be sure to recognize and to treat. To give an illustration of what does glaucoma look like to an ophthalmologist, this is the optic nerve, or a picture of a real life optic nerve. This is a normal looking optic nerve. You can see it's shaped kind of like a donut in that little circle, the tan circle next to the picture. It kind of gives a representation of that donut shaped optic nerve, that rim of the donut being the, the tissue of the actual nerve fibers going in to communicate to the brain and communicate visual information. That's what it's, the optic nerve looks like in a healthy eye. In glaucoma, you notice that hole of the donut or that gap in the circle is way bigger. That happens because the edges of the optic nerve get thinner and thinner and eroded over time until instead of a nice thick rim all the way around, it becomes really kind of a, a thin crescent. Uh, and, and that's what glaucoma looks like to us looking at the back of the eye, the optic nerve really losing tissue over time. And unfortunately, as of now, it's not a process that we can reverse. Uh, so really important to recognize and to treat. Of course, from the patient's perspective, glaucoma doesn't look or feel like this. This is just what we see. What the patient notices is the loss of peripheral vision over time. And sometimes that's not noticed until it's quite advanced. But the principle of peripheral vision loss, I think it's illustrated fairly well in this um, diagram from the National Eye Institute. You can see on the left, a normal picture, two boys and two balls. You can see fairly clear, good contrast, full field of vision is notable. In glaucoma, it becomes a little fuzzier. The central vision is okay, but you'll notice the edges of that picture are kind of hazy and grayed out. It's not a perfect representation of what glaucoma looks like to a patient, but that's the idea. The peripheral vision is getting lost. Central vision maintains until the end. So oftentimes it's not noticed until quite late unless we're screening and, and, and treating and maintaining care for patients who are at, have glaucoma or at high risk or developing glaucoma. Now, when we see a patient, we do look at their optic nerve as, as shown in those earlier images, but we can't, as physicians, can't put ourselves in a patient's shoes to see exactly what field of vision the patient's noticing. Um, so we have to think of other ways to do that. Uh, one tool that we use to measure a field of vision over time is the, is the visual field machine or perimeter. It's basically a big white bowl. You look into this white dome and white lights flicker and the, the patient would click the remote when the, um, when the white light is noticed. And those white lights happen in the peripheral vision. And when the lights are noticed, it gets registered. And when the light is missed, then, then we, the machine and algorithm will, will notice a, a peripheral field defect or decrease in vision. What the output from that visual field looks like to us as ophthalmologists looking at the data, you can see that middle image, that visual field that's pretty much, this is normal. It's kind of, it's grayscale all the way around. There's one little black dot there, and that's the normal blind spot. Everybody, everybody has a normal blind spot. That's a normal visual field. You recognize there are two crosshairs, the horizontal and, and, and vertical lines there, and that where they meet is that area of focus, that central vision and the peripheral vision is extended beyond it. You can, you can see in this normal visual field is, is nice and, and clear and, um, and completely normal. In the glaucoma example, you can see there's darkening of the visual field, generally starting from the periphery and working its way. I wanted to show this sort of introduction to what visual field tests look like in glaucoma, because we'll show some examples of, of follow-up over time and, and how things can change in glaucoma um, if there's not enough follow-up or not enough treatment. Glaucoma, it's a progressive disease. It can get worse over time. Uh, it, a progression can be slowed down or stopped altogether with adequate re treatment, but there's no cure. Um, and the vision that's lost is, is permanent. You can't get back vision that's been lost in the visual field. So those dark spots in the visual field can't come back. Our goal in all treatments is to preserve what's left in glaucoma, which really highlights the importance of finding mild cases early and keeping that close follow-up over time to prevent glaucoma from getting worse, because oftentimes left untreated, it will. Patients on their own tend not to notice the presence of glaucoma-related visual field changes um, until they become quite advanced. And you can imagine that with this case example here, the 2005 visual field the technology really hasn't changed too much, uh, unfortunately, but the visual field data are, are pretty robust and, and longitudinal. You can see the 2005, a little tiny dark spot in the periphery, probably doesn't have any meaningful impact on the patient's leg, but it's such a wonderful time to start treating glaucoma to prevent it from getting worse. 
has happened in this case, you can see as the years goes on, that dark spot gets bigger and kind of works its way close to that bullseye, the, the center of the crosshair, sort of the central fixation. And that's when you get into things like fall risk, difficulty reading, difficulty navigating the world. And that, this, it really highlights the importance of treating glaucoma early and making sure you have that relationship with the patient to maintain long-term treatment over time. A couple of more points about glaucoma. This is not a rare disease. It's very common. It's the most common cause of irreversible blindness in the world. Um, it affects 2% of people over 40 in the United States. It's predominantly driven by genetics. It's nothing that something somebody something somebody would do to get glaucoma. For the most part, it's pre-programmed. Um, older age, as people get older, as tends to be when glaucoma shows up in every decade of life, that risk gets quite a bit bigger. Having a family history, getting to that genetic point, there's a first degree relative with glaucoma, a mother or a father or a sibling, and then there's a high risk of that individual developing glaucoma as well. It's not a one gene kind of disease where if your mother has it, you'll have it too. It's kind of a complex array of genes, but the, if there's a family history of glaucoma, our ears go up and say, you know, there's a seven times higher risk of having glaucoma if your mother or father has it. So let's look extra closely. In fact, we're doing some more initiatives in the clinic to say, not only to the patient in the chair, but to the family members next to them. You know, have you have you had an eye exam? Have you turned 40 yet? Because, you know, it's probably good to just get looked at and be plugged in. Now, uh, there's some racial disparities in glaucoma. Black race, Hispanic ethnicity have higher odds of, of having glaucoma. And the last line here is eye pressure. I've, I've gotten this far talking about glaucoma without talking about eye pressure. These two concepts go hand in hand, although eye pressure is not part of the definition. High eye pressure is certainly associated with glaucoma, but there are people out there of high pressures and no problems, and there are people with glaucoma. In fact, a third of patients with glaucoma have a normal pressure but have, uh, develop glaucoma. So it's a piece of the puzzle as far as risk for glaucoma, but certainly not the defining feature. That said, eye pressure is the one thing we can change of all those risk factors. We can't change age, we can't change family history, but what we can change is the eye pressure. Glaucoma is treatable. So I don't want to sound too dire with those earlier, earlier slides. There is no cure for glaucoma, but many treatments are out there to help lower the eye pressure and to preserve the visual field to prevent worsening over time. Our goal is to maintain vision. We have a number of tools to do that, all related to lowering the eye pressure. Just some examples of those tools that we use to treat eye pressure and glaucoma. You may have heard kind of most often the starting point is an eye drop, either a once a day or a twice a day eye drop. The drop to the surface of the eye helps lower eye pressure through medication. But there are also other treatments out there too. A laser treatment in the office helps to stimulate the natural drain of the eye, that spongy looking thing in the picture that the yellow, the green laser beam is treating. Um, so a laser procedure to lower eye pressure. And uh, if needed for patients who have very advanced disease or who are progressing very quickly and for whom eye drops and lasers not enough, there is the option of surgery, going to the operating room to do one of a variety of procedures to help decrease eye pressure. And all this is lowering eye pressure. Um, and in surgery, we do that by having another outflow for the fluid of the eye, whether that's through putting a small silicon tube in to decompress and lower the pressure or making your blood or a little uh, elevation of the white of the eye to help the fluid flow. So treatments out there to lower the eye pressure and maintain vision in glaucoma. But all of these treatments require monitoring over time. There is no cure. It's not like you get a surgery for glaucoma and that patient's cured forever and doesn't need to come back. These treatments all can wear off over time and may not work well as months, years, or decades go on. Oftentimes patients need more than one treatment, whether that's multiple eye drops or repeat laser treatments or additional surgery. Uh, you know, there's there's no panacea for glaucoma, certainly no cure. Uh, but again, we have these tools and we can deploy them to preserve vision if we're able to maintain consistent follow-up to see that patient. And related to that, if there are lapses in care, if there are patients who have difficulty accessing regular care and become, say, lost to follow-up, um, that can lead to preventable but irreversible vision loss from under treatment from glaucoma. So it's really important to have those regular visual field tests and those regular eye exams to help maintain care in glaucoma. And this isn't just anecdote. If there are lapses in care from glaucoma, it can lead to permanent irreversible vision loss. I showed some examples of what that visual field test looks like earlier. 
Um, this is an example from a real life patient, a patient of mine, um, who had trouble accessing follow up and maintaining care. You can see the very top slides, so left eye and right eye on the top. Uh, in 2018, a little bit of change in that far periphery, kind of in between those two. Uh, uh, certainly glaucoma, but not much to affect daily life. This would be an excellent opportunity to really help treat, keep the pressure low, and to maintain that current level of vision for a lifetime. Um, unfortunately, when patients face things like transportation barriers, difficulty getting off of work or insurance lapses, there could be long lapses in care. And when this patient came back five years later, those visual fields look a lot darker. You can see in the middle panel of slides there, a lot more black areas in the visual field. And again, the black areas are areas that are not being seen well. And in this case, defects from her phone. And again, some issues with follow-up, but we were kind of persistent to try to get her back in clinic. About a year later, you can see it's almost a complete blackout of the visual fields, tiny little areas of gray in the middle. So it's some central vision, kind of biggie in the eye chart now in both eyes, um, but was able to get her to surgery and with famous help, actually. We'll talk about that. Um, and ended up operating on both eyes in the same day, kind of very aggressively treating and lowering pressure, and she's been able to maintain care since. So this is a huge problem. That, of course, is an anecdote, but looking largely, more largely at, at large data sets to say what, what really happens to patients with lapses in care. We remember these cases, the ones that do poorly after a few years, but what if you look overall? Of all patients who have a lapse of more than a year and come back, generally, how do they do? And I asked this question using a data set um, back when I was at Duke, just look over 10 years, how do our glaucoma patients do? How many patients get lost to follow up or have these lapses in care? And of those who come back, how do they fare? When those that come back, two thirds had a significant progression of their disease or complication um, because related to that lapse in care. And that lapse in care is usually several years. So this is important. Lapses in care do lead to vision loss. Really highlighting this point, that second bullet point saying glaucoma is a chronic condition, requires long-term follow. -up. Many treatments are available. We can preserve vision from glaucoma, but we really have to maintain regular care to make sure we stay on top of it. Unfortunately, a lot of People don't. A lot of patients struggle to maintain regular care in their home. That study from Duke that I referenced in the last slide, you know, I found a third of patients had a significant lapse of a year or more uh, in their glaucoma care. And that's a lot. And that led me to, to pursue a grant to look at a national registry to say, if we look at a national ophthalmic database from practices across the country, looked at half a million glaucoma patients and their follow-up patterns. We found about half of them over the six-year period had a lapse in care or were lost to follow-up altogether. So missing care for multiple years ago. These are patients with glaucoma. They've had that diagnosis and they've met with an ophthalmologist and they, and they still have trouble accessing care, maintaining follow-up over time. Um, and we know that that leads to poor outcomes. And if that's not disheartening enough, not only is a lapse in care clinically consequential and unfortunately common in glaucoma, it affects our most vulnerable patients. Looking at that IRIS registry or that National Registry of Ophthalmic Patients, uh, we investigated, okay, what is the scope of the problem of loss to follow? Very high, but who tends, who are the patients we're most worried about? If we look at the demographic and clinical factors of the first visit that we have, who can we predict will become lost to follow up over time so we know who to focus on? And it's the groups that are really most vulnerable to, to glaucoma, the most the oldest patients have the highest rates of loss of follow-up. Minority racial groups, the same groups that are most prone to get glaucoma in the first place are the most prone to become lost of follow-up and have progression. And the clinical factors I thought were really striking. Patients who have the most severe stages of glaucoma are the most likely to be lost from care. These are the very patients we want to see the most often to treat most aggressively and to follow each other very closely in this glaucoma process. And they're the ones who are most likely to be lost of follow-up. And patients who have visual impairment or blindness are likewise the most likely to be lost from care. This really speaks to the barriers to care that these patients face in, in maintaining long-term follow-up, but this really highlights the problem of loss to follow-up. Not only is it common in leading to vision loss, but it's affecting their patients who are most prone to losing vision from work. So a huge problem, access to care is gonna be really critical to help our glaucoma patients maintain this follow-up over time, because without follow-up, glaucoma is going to get worse. Like with a lot of conditions, it's progressive unless it's treated. And I think one thing that I've really been emphasizing through this work and, and through the research we're doing is saying, we need to put a lot of effort in to helping our patients maintain care because we 
oftentimes make a diagnosis and situations come up where patients can't maintain care. And it, I think it's probably everyone's responsibility to give patients the resources they need to help take care of their illness. Because it's, it's a partnership you know, between the patient and the physician. It's kind of a lot of ground up at once. I wanted to kind of recap where we are so far as we transition into social needs and patient navigation to address these. So we talked about glaucoma, chronic, irreversible, potentially blinding, but treatments are available. Treatments can preserve vision, no cures, but we can preserve vision with treatment if we have long-term consistent follow-up to monitor the course of the disease, to monitor response to treatment, and to make adjustments as time goes. And that said, loss to follow up is common, unfortunately, the most common among the most vulnerable groups. And that really speaks to health disparities in glaucoma care, thinking about demographic and clinical health disparities. And this ties into a concept that I want to talk a little bit more about social determinants of health or health related social needs, understanding what, it is, what is it that, faces, that, get, that keeps patients from being able to access care and maintain care. Again, these are all patients who've established care with an ophthalmologist. I'm not, not even getting into the patients who don't have a diagnosis. These are patients who've been diagnosed with glaucoma and who've been seen and treated by an eye doctor and still have trouble accessing care at regular intervals. How can we understand their social circumstances that's keeping them from maintaining consistent care? And that gets us to the second part of sort of the, the roadmap overview of our discussion today, not only talking about glaucoma and the importance of follow-up, but getting into these social needs and the role of social determinants of health in maintaining glaucoma care. Glaucoma, how can we help glaucoma patients maintain care? I think addressing these social needs is critically important. So social determinants of health are the environments where people live and work, things like having a safe neighborhood, having health insurance, being able to access transportation to make it to medical appointments, into the pharmacy to pick up medications. Um, these are all factors that affect health in general. In fact, there's some measures affects like 80 to 90% of an individual's health, the social circumstances in which they live. And these are things that not are only important for general health, they are truly specific to eye health as well. And this is something that we published on with Dr. Sahel to say, if we look at what factors affect access to eye care and visual impairment and risk of visual impairment and blindness over time? We find that each one of these five categories of social determinants of health play a role in access to eye care and risk of blindness. Things like having health insurance, having a safe neighborhood, um, you know, that social community context, finances, and uh, access to education. These are all critically important things to help maintain eye health. And I think they underlie, and we'll show you kind of make our case to you all the reason that these social determinants of health may be playing a big critical role in these lapses in care and welcome that we've been talking about. And I think, you know, this sort of started as you know, an idea, an academic discussion, but one thing that was really important to me was reaching out to patients to talk to them directly and understand what our most vulnerable patients need and if we're really getting at something at the social determinants question stuff. Like, is, is, are these social factors as important as we think? And how do they tie into specific barriers to care? And so we asked, well, I wanted to know what do our glaucoma patients face as far as barriers to consistent follow? -up? We received a grant from the American Glaucoma Society and hired a professional call center. The School of Public Health here at Pitt has a professional call center um, for, for scientists to ask uh, questions. And that was, I thought, particularly important because this group of patients that may be particularly um, hard to reach. What we did is we chose patients who missed appointments with us here at UPMC on our glaucoma service. We look to see which glaucoma patients have a no-show appointment, meaning they scheduled an appointment but did not attend it. And we know from other research that a no-show appointment is really an inflection point. Once that appointment's missed, it's a big red flag of becoming lost to follow. So I knew that this no-show uh, encounter was gonna be a really big, I think, point to determine which patients are worth reaching out to, because we know no show, high risk of loss to follow up. This moment's a really good one to call and reach out uh, to understand why this patient had a scheduled appointment but wasn't able to attend it. So we called, and um, the call center reached out to start at 170 patients, and about 51 of them completed the whole questionnaire. That was pretty good in terms of persistence, perhaps, to the call center, but also the engagement with patients um, to answer these questions. So we asked, again, these are all patients who have a diagnosis of glaucoma, 
who've been seeing us and who've scheduled and missed an appointment. And we asked them, what are the reasons that we're being non-judgmental? We just want to learn how to help folks and optimize how we take care of our patients. But what are the reasons and barriers you face to attending appointments? Did you know you missed an appointment? And what can we do differently to help you take care of your eyes? Number one, far and away, was transportation challenges. We published these results in the Journal of Oklahoma. Uh, we asked patients, why did you miss that appointment? I couldn't get a ride. I live too far away. The person who usually drives me wasn't able to make it. So transportation really lit up. About a third of patients had a transportation need. The other reasons were, were factors such as keeping track of the appointment or wanting to have had a reminder message, which is something we've, we've changed. And then uh, financial uh, reasons, things like insurance, copay, and the costs of care. The transportation really did show up as that, that number one reason that people struggle to maintain care. And again, these are glaucoma patients who are most worried about. Had a no-show, have glaucoma, may go several years without being seen and are at high risk of their condition getting worse. So not only did we ask them, why did you miss the appointment or what were the barriers you have to care? And we, by the way, we asked a structured questionnaire and also a free response, and those are very consistent with each other. So transportation really like you. And we introduced at this point to the patient, you know, we have someone here who specializes in connecting patients with resources. We have a very unique, special patient navigator program where we can have a specialist reach out and talk to you about resources that are available to potentially help address some of these barriers to care. And then about a third of patients, again, this is a cold call, you know, from a third party, not even from our department, but a third of them said, you know, actually, I haven't talked to this Dana person. I think that what you're offering might be getting at some of the issues I'm having with maintaining care. And I thought that was really promising and perhaps highlighting that we're getting to the right track with understanding the barriers our patients face, knowing that follow-up is so, so important in glaucoma, and being able to offer patients somebody to talk to who can connect them with the resources they need to help take care of their lives. Things like getting a ride, things like getting financial assistance, getting health insurance. How can we help patients get these social factors, these social determinants of health, and get address what we can to help them maintain their eye care and maintain vision from glaucoma? The patient navigator program here, we started um, at Dr. Sahel. Now, me, Dr. Sahel, leadership, we got this program started um, with support from the foundation in 2021. And Dana come on, came on board as our patient navigator to act as a liaison between the patient, the healthcare system, and the community. There are tons of community resources out there that can help patients in need. There are insurance-based and county-based programs for medical transportation. But if a patient with transportation barriers doesn't know their insurance has that benefit, doesn't know their county has that benefit, doesn't know how to apply for it, then it's not really helpful. Having somebody act as that glue, having Dana here as a patient navigator to connect patients with these resources has been critically important to address these barriers to care. And she connects, you'll hear from her directly here in a couple of moments, connects with things like transportation, financial assistance, insurance, and even kind of more human things like coordinating appointments to making sure that patients can get the eye care that they need and maintain that consistent follow-up, which especially in my world with glaucoma is just so, so important in helping them to take care of their eyes. Probably more important than any procedure or laser treatment I could do is to have that patient maintain care, understand that it's important to have that consistent follow-up and have the resources to be able to afford medications and have that consistency of care. So enough about me talking about Dana, I think it's probably way more important for Dana to talk about the work she does as our patient navigator, program manager, leading these efforts for the department over the last several years and really making a big difference for our patients' lives. So I'm going to switch over to Dana to start talking and we'll all come together for a conversation with you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So my role here um, at the Mercy Vision Institute, and I also help patients at the satellite offices. I help them overcome any barriers that stand in the way of them receiving timely care. And like we had talked about, transportation is a big concern, I'm getting them health care coverage, getting them connected with even food pantries is critical. And also I do have a re lots of referrals in the community that I utilize. And I have a list here. Um, these are just some of them. And when I do refer a patient to any of these agencies, I do follow up. I'll give it a few days after I submit the referral. I'll call, make sure the referral was received, and then I'll also follow up with the patient. 
And we not only see and observe all the work that Dana's doing, but I, we thought it was really important to publish the results you're doing because it's so impactful. And I think something that other ophthalmology departments or any department could really help to, to you know, model off of us. And so we published, we published the results that Dana's doing, the Synod the Journal of Academic Ophthalmology. And this is just from the very early days. What we did is we looked at first quarter of 2022 to say, you know, what kind of work are we doing with, with Dana leading with her program to help patients? What sorts of problems do patients have? And is it successful? Are we doing a good job? And so we looked back and she, she helped over the three month, first three months of 2022. Again, when this program was fairly nascent and referrals weren't quite, you know, kind of getting the word out that it exists even over those three months, helped 125 patients. Not surprisingly, based on some of our other data, transportation lit, lit, lit up as number one, helping patients get a ride. Insurance is number two, and uh, finances or financial assistance coming in as the, the third one. And you know, we not only do we look to see why patients came to Dana, but we look to see what did Dana do? What, how are we helping with this program to help patients accomplish these, these tasks to overcome barriers and maintain care? And 98% received support for in some way or another, which is wonderful. And really tellingly, 90% had their case closed or that issue resolved. We're able to get plugged in with transportation, ready to go and maintain care. And it ends up being not just for their eyes, but this helps them all, all you know, helps the whole person maintain their care. Not only do we look at our notes to say we did this and we did that and we closed this case, uh, we hired a research assistant and she called patients. We wanted to say, it's quality improvement project. What do patients say about this program? Is there anything we should be doing differently? Are we being as effective as we say we are? And we called patients and by far and away, patients were effusively in praise of how the work that Dana's helped them do. You know, they want a patient navigator for other aspects of their lives. Like being able to have somebody who cares and is able to supply them with the resources that exist in the community has been a huge boom. You know, three quarters of patients said the program helped them take care of their eyes. I thought that was really telling because this is what it ultimately comes down to is helping our patients maintain eye care, whatever conditions they have, but to be able to get here and to get what they need to take care of their eyes. And I think this paper really spoke to the work Dana has been doing and we're doing some follow-up projects related to this. It really just shows that this program really works. In 2023, um, I encountered 535 patients and some of the referrals that I helped these patients with were housing, insurance, primary care physicians, and not just giving the name of a primary care doctor to the patient. I would ask them, you know, would you like a male provider, a female provider, um, if there were any language barriers, then I would actually call that primary care doctor and set up the appointment for them transportation assistance, either through medical assistance, transportation access is one of the bigger carriers here in Allegheny County and utility assistance. So going through the LIHE program, um, which is for the low income housing energy assistance program and also the CAP program, which is the customer assistance program. So if the patient qualified, they would get assistance toward their utility bill. We wanted to share one, we have two case studies, but the first one is a 71-year-old female. She presented to the Vision Institute for glasses. She does have glaucoma, but she has not had an exam in 10 years. So you can see her visual field in her right eye and that she's very limited on her vision. So she required a lot of assistance. She had a lot of barriers to care for access to transportation. She recently had lost her husband and she was struggling to maintain her home. No working appliance, her stove was not working. She had very limited furniture. Her utilities were shut off and she was using her neighbor's electricity to just charge her cell phone. So how I assisted her was with transportation. I chose to get her enrolled in both access and medical assistance transportation program. Um, access will provide transportation to medical appointments and they'll also provide transportation if this individual wanted to go grocery shopping to the bank, maybe a hair appointment, where medical assistance transportation is only for medical appointments. 
And with housing, we got her set up with the financial programs to help with her utility bills. Um, we, I had reached out to the um, blessing board in Lawrenceville and they helped her get a stove, some furniture. And then I reached out to Breathe Pennsylvania and they were able to deliver her a window air conditioner. She was set up with Mills on Wills, so we, she received um, three mills a week. And then I got her glasses through the Lions Club. And then I also assisted her with obtaining the death certificate for her spouse. She does require continued engagement, continued follow-up. Um, she does miss appointments. So what I have done is if I know she has an appointment in three days, I'll reach out to her, give her that reminder, make sure she scheduled that transportation. She did have a successful surgery and she continues to require long-term follow-up, but she's stable. And it's really because of Dana that we're able to get her to surgery. This is a patient who came to me with terrible, terrible glaucoma on that right eye. And the left eye wasn't too far behind. Pressure's creeping up too. And she comes in and has that eye exam because her lights are off. She's living in the dark. And now, because she was able to go through our patient navigator program, able to get resources to, you know, get utilities turned back on and have a variety of appointments and able to maintain care. So, yeah, good answer. Thank you. There was another patient. She was from our Natrona Heights office. She's 75 years old. She has narrow angle glaucoma and she could no longer get to her appointments. Um, her husband developed dementia and she was not able, he was not able to drive her and her daughter moved to Germany. So I went to the Neutrona Heights office, got her set up with access. And these are my notes from her medical record. So it's just showing that I met with her, started the application, followed up with the application, and then let the patient know she'll be receiving that welcome back from access. So I think it's so important. I mean, it's so easy just to say, here's an application. The patient probably 99% of the time will not complete that application. So following through, making sure it was completed is very important. So like I said, she was able to get access to her medical appointments. She did have another successful cataract surgery and everything is stable. And then th that is a photo of the access shuttle bus. It is shared ride. So you are on with other people going to other facilities for their own appointments. I thought that was such a wonderful example too. Another patient of mine that Dana helped with just showing how persistent Dana is and really guiding the patient through the process. There's a lot going on this patient needed cataract surgery. There's a lot to process. She has glaucoma. And on top of that, all this paperwork for other programs, Dana really makes that side of things so much more seamless, being able to talk with her. This patient has social stressors, taking care of her husband at home. So being able to have someone guide her through the process, take care of herself, allow her to get the cataract surgery with me and really improve her life and, and keep her glaucoma sustained. I think th these examples are, are kind of maybe one complex one and more one more kind of routine kind of consult, but the ways that Dana really makes a huge impact through her patient navigator program for our patients. And those are just a couple of patients of mine. I'm just one doc of like 50 here. So she does a lot of work for a lot of folks. And I know we're gonna do some Q and A here uh, shortly. I just wanted to sort of give a summary of the ground we're covering. Glaucoma, again, we first third of the talk was talking about what glaucoma is, just emphasizing this is a really important condition that requires long-term care and follow-up. And there's a lot of problems with follow-up in glaucoma that I think could be addressed if we pay more attention and have more resources dedicated to addressing some of these underlying social factors or social determinants of health because they really underlie the barriers to care and barriers to follow up a patient's case, particularly our patients with glaucoma. Of course, it's not just a glaucoma problem, diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, lots of eye conditions, patient threatening eye conditions require chronic long-term care. Glaucoma is a particularly illustrative example, but don't get me wrong, Dana's work extends way beyond that. And I think that as an example, the patient navigator program really can help patients to maintain their care, ultimately to preserve their sight. And, and we are addressing social needs in, lot, in several ways. Dana is probably the, the feature of, of the work we're doing in this area. But now things like reminder messages. I mentioned during that call center study that 
keeping track of the appointment was a struggle for some patients. Now we have reminder messages and publish on these outcomes to show that if you remind the patient there's an appointment coming up, it does help um, maintain that care. So little things along the way, but to show just such a robust and unique program our department has through Dana and her efforts that she's leading, I think really illustrates how we can address a lot of these barriers to care and not just give up, to really get there, help patients, meet with them, understand their needs, and help take care of their eyes for the long term, ultimately maintaining sight and improving quality of life. Oh, I should also give a shout out to our funders. I'm sorry, Heather, I didn't get you. Um, the Ideal Foundation is a huge one. Thank you so much. The Hillman Foundation. We've also received grants from other societies, a um, couple of Oklahoma societies and research from blindness. And the NSF has funded some of this work in the realm of diabetic pregnancy. So, and thanks, Heather. Thanks to the foundation, of course, for having us. And I look forward to having a conversation from here. Well, thank you both. Uh, you know, we have quite a few questions, but I have quite a few questions too. And you know, th the biggest one is how many programs across the country are asking this question of patients coming through the door? You know, I know that this is something that we, the Department of Ophthalmology and UPMC Vision Institute does routinely, and we have Dana. How is this working in other parts of the country? Yeah, we are very unique. And this, this concept of a patient navigator started in the oncology world 20 years ago or so, mm -hmm. where patients with cancer have different places to go, different forms to keep track of, and a patient navigator would help um, guide through that process. And then other departments, perhaps more slowly, have been adopting it. Cardiology, as several departments have. Mm -hmm. But ophthalmology, it, we are very unique in having data. There are other departments engaged with departments of social work at the same institution, um, which helps and fills a lot of the same sort of task. But to be able to be side by side and have an office next to somebody um, here who specializes in patient navigation is unique. And I think one of a kind, at least as far as I could tell in our literature search, and we're very unique. And that's why I really thought it was important to publish on those outcomes and kind of go to the rooftop and, and talk to ophthalmologists across the country, academic centers to say, this is worth doing. This helps patients maintain care. This is a fundamental part of our mission is helping take care of patients and take care of their eye conditions. And it's not just eye drops and surgeries, it's helping the whole person. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's that connective tissue that keeps someone moving forward. And many of the patients that are needing help, they've had other issues health-wise, personally, that have been difficult for them. So having a patient navigator to pick up, to help them, is invaluable. So speaking of a couple of these, we have a lot of questions. I'm just going to Start. Okay. Do people with diabetes have a higher risk of glaucoma? That is a controversial question, believe it or not. Some of that, and I you get this from time to time. Um, the short answer is the jury's out. There were some early studies for patients with ocular hypertension or high eye pressure, but not glaucoma, and showed that diabetes was protective. And there's some thought that perhaps diabetes is protective against glaucoma, and then there's some conflicting data um, that perhaps contradicted that, maybe. Um, no, no clear relationship, sometimes a risk. The short answer is the jury's out. Um, no definitive relationship, although some diabetes medications may be helpful for glaucoma in ways we don't quite understand. So, Like metformin? Like yeah, there's, so in the, the ocular hypertension study, I think there was one thought that the confounding effect was metformin, that the diabetic patients were mild, generally on metformin, which could be potentially a neuroprotective medication. Um, and so perhaps that's why there were fewer patients developing glaucoma in the diabetes group. Even that hasn't played out because there's later a randomized trial that's actually fairly expensive to run that showed metformin did not uh, lead to decreased uh, incidence of glaucoma. The jury's out, but important to take care of diabetes regardless. Absolutely. So uh, second question, is the increased eye pressure that results from glaucoma painful? That's also a good question. The short answer is oftentimes not. By and large, the high eye pressure is not something people notice. There are certainly instances where that's not the case. So if there's a very sudden increase in eye pressure, I'm thinking like the types of glaucoma where the drain of the eye shuts all of a sudden, we call that the angle closure type of glaucoma. Uh -huh. it happens acutely, then the pressure spike is noticeable. Big headache, brow ache, you know, nausea, definitely noticeable. But more often than not, patients have that open angle or long-term kind of glaucoma where the pressure can creep up very gradually and slowly over time where patients could have a pressure that's two or three standard deviations above the mean and not even notice it. In fact, that case one example that Dana presented, a patient of mine, she presented with a pressure of like 35 or 40. So the high end of normal is normally about 20. 
and nothing she knew or felt. She just wanted glasses. So it, it was, uh, it's often asymptomatic or not noticeable at all. Um, and, you know, that case is also illustrated for not noticing having glaucoma. She didn't know her right eye was, was that, that far gone because her left eye had been compensating and, and, and it was sort of totally unrecognized despite a high pressure in visual field loss. So oftentimes glaucoma is very sneaky like that. It really is not something someone notices until it gets quite advanced. Good, good question. Okay. Can you have both cataracts and glaucoma and what are the distinctions? Oh, great question. The answer is yes. And uh, the second case example did have both uh, a cataract. We didn't talk too much about um, is a clouding of the natural lens of the eye. So the eye has a lens in the front to focus the light and an optic nerve in the back to transmit that signal. The cataract is a clouding of the lens in the front of the eye. It happens to everybody over time. As time goes on, everybody gets some degree of cataract and many people need cataract surgery, very routine, uh, most commonly performed surgery in the world. Um, separately, the optic nerve problem is glaucoma, where high eye pressure or even normal eye pressure um, can result in optic nerve tissue loss in that cupping phenomenon we showed in earlier slides. Um, so cataracts kind of in the front, glaucoma mostly in the back. Um, that said, there is some relationship in that uh, cataracts can get thick enough to press on the natural drain of the eye and lead to high eye pressure. So oftentimes cataract surgery, even though it doesn't treat glaucoma, it actually lowers eye pressure a couple of points because taking the bulky cataract out helps the fluid flow. But that's the distinction. Cataract lens in the front of the eye, glaucoma is the optic nerve in the back of the eye. Um, and you could, a person could certainly have both, and almost everybody gets a cataract, whereas fewer people get glaucoma. Thank you. Um, do people with glaucoma always end up with blindness before they die? Or is it possible they never get to that end result? I Good love question. that question. This, this kind of, this comes up a lot, especially that first diagnosis visit with the patient. Like, you know, goodness, glaucoma is terrible. I'm, you know, is this something I'm going to go blind from? Like, how much longer do I have? You know, should I sell my car? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. We don't have a cure, but we have so many treatments to maintain the vision. We're able to keep that progression to near zero over decades. And there are young patients who get glaucoma from genetic mutations and other things. Mm -hmm able to maintain their sight for decades with minimal change to glaucoma, as long as we have that close relationship and that close, careful follow-up and monitoring the appropriate treatments, that there is nothing foregone about glaucoma. We're able to have a partnership to maintain vision, and blindness is actually quite rare for glaucoma. As long as we're plugged in and receiving treatment, able to maintain sight, maintain independence, maintain driving. Um, glaucoma is something treatable, and, and by no means is it is this written off as um, blindness being, being inevitable. And keeping up with your appointments, coming to see you. That's why Dana is so important in this. Yeah, it's all good. That's exactly the message I'm hoping to convey, that this is treatable, long-term mm -hmm. relationships are critically important, and social needs and, and help from people like Dana to help make sure that this long-term treatment happens among the most vulnerable patients who are at the highest risk of going blind and missing visits. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What's the average progression of the disease? The average progression of the disease? Yeah, it, that's a good question. Um, under treatment, it's quite low. You know, decades go by and minimal change can happen. Um, for untreated patients or for patients for whom the eye pressure stays too high for too long, um, the slope of change so that global score of visual field can be quite steeper. Um, but the average progression, you know, by and large, one thing I like to, to, to say is most patients we see are going to be fine. They will live their full lives without even noticing the peripheral vision loss that happened with them. That their other eye compensates, it's far in the periphery, going to be just fine undergoing treatment. And so to think, well, you know, what is the progression? How much longer do I have to extrapolate? How long? What if I live this long? Will I go blind then? Your, most patients with glaucoma are going to be just fine. This is not something that uh, is going to be noticed unless we have lapses in care or that happens to be a quickly progressive form of glaucoma. Mm -hmm. As long as there's that contact where we maintain that care and maintain close treatment and monitoring, um, we're, we can make it so that glaucoma is just something you take an eye drop for, not something you know is day to day. It's not true for everybody, but for the most part, as long as we're having early enough recognition of glaucoma and long-term maintenance of care, things are going to be all right. And again, talk to your provider and see if you can get Dana to help you so we, you can keep coming back to your appointments. And that's that's a really important point too, Heather, because not only is it important to recognize glaucoma early, 
but it's right. a recognized social needs pool. And yes. one thing I didn't talk about in this talk, but Dana and I talked about earlier at a presentation this morning, is we screen for social needs here. We ask patients when they check in, are there troubles with transportation or finances or health insurance that we should know about? And if mm -hmm. there's a positive flag, then that allows us to introduce that topic in the conversation and to introduce resources such as Dana to say, you know, you, you said you had trouble getting to, to your rides or picking up prescriptions. Is there something we could do? Would you like to meet with somebody to help with that? To really screen, not just doing a phone call after an appointment's missed, but to say for everybody, what needs do we have on file and how can we help address them? And I think that's, pretty, that's something primary care has been doing for decades in women's health as well. And now mm -hmm. we are the third one's in, you know, able to implement the screen across all of our sites using the UPMC standard uh, questionnaire and electronic record. And I think, I think it's just wonderful to ask those questions because we can't help the social needs if we don't ask or identify them. So I think, as you mentioned, that's, that's just incredibly important to identify social needs to address them. But the patient also has to speak up. And there's, you know, that's also the message that we're giving <laughs> that, the, you know, there is no shame in telling us that you need help getting to an appointment because that's what we want for the patient too. Sometimes they don't know how to ask. Correct. Um, okay, this one far more interesting and out of left field, but is there a correlation between post rubella syndrome and glaucoma? There is, that's a very specific question. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we think of uh, rubella syndrome, we worry about hearing loss, cataracts and glaucoma, sort of the um, three main things with some pigmentary retinopathy changes. But the short answer is yes, we, we monitor, uh, I have several post rubella patients, interestingly, um, we monitor glaucoma over time. Treatments are the same, um, just sort of unique condition to have had. Okay. Uh, we answered a little bit of this already, but I'm going to ask it again. Um, aside from the gradual visual loss, does the glaucoma patient have other warnings such as pain, feelings of pressure, or headaches? Almost always no. Kind of like we were talking about earlier, there are some forms of glaucoma that can happen all at once. If the drain of the eye closes and the pressure goes from normal to far above normal, over the course of a couple hours, that's noticeable. But for most patients, glaucoma is not noticed until it's quite advanced. That's why screening is so important and getting plugged in is so critical. Yes, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is a personal question, which we will send to Dana. Um, so the next one, can the program help with other eye issues like uh, NAON? Do I pronounce that right? Na no. Yeah, N-A-I-O-N. Yes. As far as um, patient navigation and any eye condition, I mean, Dana, of course, we talk about glaucoma because I like talking with Dana and I share a lot of patients yes. with Dana, um, but Dana takes care of a lot of docs. She doesn't just take care of me. And uh, yes. for neuro-ophthalmology patients, patients with things like NAION, which is an optic nerve condition that's different than glaucoma, um, the, the social issues are, are the, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, for any patient, regardless of their eye conditions, uh, this is something that uh, we're able to help. That's great. So, um, do you accept volunteers to help with this program? That is a great question. And so we are currently talking about that. Mm -hmm. Nothing has been finalized yet. But if you would like to volunteer to help with some of this, we do have the Mission of Mercy yes. initiative coming up and we're looking for volunteers. It is at the convention center. And you can find out more about it on the INR Foundation website. Uh, there's lots to do there. And there's a lot of help that we need to see almost a thousand patients over two days that are in need. Is the link on there? Um, I believe it is, but if not, we will get it on our website very quickly. Okay. So, but we would love if anyone wants to volunteer, it's a great way to start with us on this project. And finally, can you have glaucoma in only one eye? Yeah, great question. Glaucoma is almost always a both eye, I would say bilateral and asymmetric. So both eyes often affected, but one eye usually progresses before the other. You got a sense of that in that first case example um, where you know, right eye was quite constricted and left eye was normal. Um, but there are also instances where glaucoma truly is a one eye problem. Glaucoma isn't just a genetic condition like the most common type is. It can also happen after a trauma. So if somebody gets kicked by a horse or has some major traumatic event uh, and one eye only, that eye would be at particularly high risk of uh, one eye kind of um, 
unilateral or one-sided glaucoma from trauma and other, other causes. Um, so, and glaucoma can result from other surgeries and different types of things that can happen. So the answer is yes, it can happen in one eye, but when we talk about the kind of most common run-of-the-mill type of glaucoma, uh, it's generally both eye condition, but often asymmetric. Well, thank you both. Thank you to our audience. I love all these questions. Uh, we will be back in two weeks with another webinar from the Department of Otolaryngology. Have a good weekend. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.